Welcome to the American Society of Magical Negroes. I don't really understand. Here at Dignity and Ambition for Magical Negroes, or DAM, we help magical Negroes from classic films go from supporting to lead. Magical Negro is a trope character that is usually black and performs one of the following functions and usually a combination. Edmund and Rojek noted three main purposes for the magical Negro in relation to the white lead character in the film. A, to assist the character. B, to help him or her discover and utilize his or her spirituality. And C, to offer a type of folk wisdom used to resolve the character's dilemma. The white character's dilemma, not the black character's gifts or spirituality, serve as the primary focus in these films. The term was made popular by Spike Lee in 2001 and has become since then a very key part of black film discourse. And sadly, still very relevant in how black people are depicted on screen. In a less magical realism sense, the magical Negro is an extension of black characters as these fonts of wisdom that exist only to serve or help the evolution of white characters. Black characters in fiction have a long history of being infantilized and treated with this sort of childish yet ancient wisdom, much like native and indigenous characters. This trope has existed in literature as well, going back, oddly enough, to even anti-slavery works. If we look at previous semi-topic Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe, the main character Uncle Tom is written as a Jesus-like figure who is ultimately martyred beaten to death by a cruel white master because he refuses to betray the whereabouts of two black women who have escaped enslavement. While Tom does use his goodness to help black women, shout out to him, his unending kindness to his white masters and his martyr characterization have become prototypical aspects of this magical Negro trope. Passivity, martyrdom, but also this unending kindness, nobility in the face of oppression, this respectability politics. What's the most dangerous animal on the planet? Sure. White people, when they feel uncomfortable. White people feeling uncomfortable precedes a lot of bad stuff for us. That's why we fight white discomfort every day. Because the happier they are, the safer we are. Director Spike Lee slams same old black stereotypes in today's films. A new phenomenon has emerged in film in recent years in which an African-American character is imbued with special powers. Filmmaker Spike Lee told a student audience during a campus visit on, fe on February 21st, and that, that's not this year. But this new image is just a reincarnation of the same old stereotype and caricature of African-Americans as, so as the noble savage or the happy slave that has been presented in film and on television for decades, continued Lee. Doing a master's tea with an audience of more than 200 students in the Calhoun College dining hall, Lee cited four recent films in which there was a magical, mystical Negro. The Family Man, What Dreams May Come, The Legend of Bag of Vance, and The Green Mile. In the later film, Lee noted the black inmate cures a prison guard of disease simply by touching him. In The Legend of Bag of Vance, a black man with all these powers teaches a young white male played by Matt Damon how to golf like a champion. The film director who frequently inspired the laughter of his audience as he prepares his talk with, as he peppers his talk with expletives was unreserved in his criticism of the new characterization of blacks, posing to his audience the question, how is it that black people have all these powers, but they use them for the benefit of white people. Welcome back to Breakdown Friday. Joseph Ward, Patrick Irvin, Professor Carl Tone Jones. We are here giving a full breakdown of what the magical Negro is, the history of it, and how it impacts us. Uh, weeks ago, we gave a clip, I gave you a clip of us talking a bit about the magical Negro and everything around it. But today we're going to dive deep into the magical Negro. And you can find the clip, I mean, the link for that clip in the description of us talking about the magical Negro. But there's a, a movie trailer out, and you can you saw some of it in there, the American Society of the Magical Negroes. And the whole purpose of the magical Negroes and the movie and the, and the whole thing is helping 
white people, using their powers to help white people. PC, you got that menacing smile on your face, my brother. Mm -hmm. What's what? First of all, of course, you know how we do. Before we jump right in, what are your thoughts on the act? What are your thoughts on the movie trailer, The American Society of the Magical Negro? Before we talk about the the clip that we just showed the young lady, what's your thoughts about the trailer? Because we I showed y'all the trailer. Well, I mean, I like the trailer. I thought it was kind of genius, but um, <laughs> to actually put it in the um, theatrical form, um, I don't know how the movie's going to turn out. But it was just interesting to see it put together. Um, you know, this whole concept around this is it really does speak to the tokenism of black people in, in, this, in white society. So when when I look at that, I just OK, I mean, it was it was like I started giggling a little bit because I thought the shit was funny. But at the same time, it's sad because you do have it, it is like a quest for assimilation of some sort that whole rush to prove to white people that we're just as good as they are. So, you know, you should allow us into your, into your graces. And so when I see something of, of that ilk, I just, you know, it's a little cringy at times because it's basically chipping away at the fact that we want white privilege. You know what I'm saying? Um, and if you just let one of us come into your world, look at how much better we can make your world. And you know, so it, it's um, there's a whole lot more to get into, but you just want me to focus on the trailer, so I'm going to land my plane right there. Yeah, take put a pin in what you're saying, take note that down what you're saying. We're gonna get back to that, Pat. What's your overall thoughts on the trailer of the American Society of the Magical Negro? Um, like I said, when we were talking before the show, I really didn't think much of it when I first saw the trailer. Uh, when I when it when it when it first came on, I did chuckle to myself. But then, as it as went on, on. Uh, it kind of annoyed me a little bit, simply because, um, black dude, magic powers, all this other stuff, willing to throw everything away because he fell in love with a white girl so that part that trope kind of aggravated me a little bit but beyond that i the concept of <laughs> there being a bunch of white and see this is where if i can this is where it kind of confused me because i'm always asking like who is this for like is the first half of the movie first half of the trailer i was like oh, okay this is going to be some tongue-in-cheek comedy shit meant to make black people laugh and kind of be like, fuck white people. Um, which, you know, okay, whatever. But then the second half of the trailer, that was marketed for a whole different audience than the first half of the trailer. Yes, it was. So it's kind of like, okay, who do you want to see this? Because you pissed off the people that you had in the first half with the second half and the people that you were going for in the second half didn't make it to the second half because of the first half. <laughs> so, but... Wait a I, minute. There two different trailers, right? Two different trailers? Uh -huh. There were two different trailers? No, we're talking about the actual trailer for the movie. The one I... Oh. The first link I put in the group chat. Okay. All right. Yeah, so... I, I was just on that. I was just kind of like, hmm, this is going to be interesting talking to people. Like we said before the show, nobody seems to be excited about the movie. And I think that is because the trailer is marketed to two diametrically opposed groups. But, you know, that was my thoughts of it was in addition to what PC said about the magical Negro and all of the, you know, the, the cultural implications of it and all of that. But just looking at the trailer, I was just kind of like, who, who is this movie? Who's supposed to go see this movie? Well, well, so <laughs> when I saw the trailer for the first time, I like, here we go with this bullshit again. Here we go again. Um, digging up the stereotypes and throwing them around. Um, it's bad enough that when black people 
when we're in a position to make our own cinema, we still recycle the same old stereotypes. But this is those recycled stereotypes on a grander scale. So basically on steroids and it's it's filled with that comedy twist. And so they're trying to make it lighthearted what they're talking about with the magical Negro. But when I saw it, I thought uh, this dumb hey, this dumb stuff go again. But also, like you said, though, um, looking at the trailer, he learns that he himself is a magical Negro. Now, what's interesting is he's a biracial magical Negro because all the other magical Negroes have been just black people. But he's like a biracial magical Negro. And then he falls in love with the white girl. Now, if he chooses, now the dynamic is he learns, the biracial dude learns that he's a magical Negro. So half of him is magical, right? His job is to make a white man's life happy and easy. But then he falls in love with a white girl. Now, if he pursues his love with a white girl, he loses his powers and he wipes out all the other magical Negroes. And he's gone too, if he goes with the white girl. Now, it and now if you think about it, it's it seems as okay, well, he's putting an end to the magical Negroes, but not necessarily because the magical Negro, the whole job of the magical Negro is to make white people's life happy and easier. So isn't that what he's gonna do with the white girl? If he go with the white girl, isn't that the same thing he would be doing? So either way, he's still being a magical Negro. He just being a more noble magical Negro. I guess they're trying to put it a more noble magical Negro because if he's able to wipe out all the other magical Negroes for the love of this white girl, then he did a noble thing. But you still being a magical Negro though, because you still not doing your magical Negro job. You're just not doing it to the person you was assigned to. But wait, but and see, this is where we would say, like, we just have to watch the movie anyways but that's why uh, I'm just saying that's that's how the trailer is presented because if his job is to hook the white girl up with the white boy no 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 his job his job ain't to hook the white girl up with the white boy his job is to make the white boy's life happy and easy it don't have nothing to do but, with the okay girl. so it looked like from the trailer the white boy end up liking the white girl Cause the white, cause remember that one scene where the white boy thought he was trying to hook him up, and he was like, right. "No, I'm not trying to hook you up." But but, uh, he, but the biracial dude end up falling for the him and the white girl from the trailer. They end up falling for each other. So, so again, we speculating from the trailer, and this right. is just about the movie, right? <laughs> but right. if his <laughs> if his job is to make the white boy happy, and the white boy fall in love with the white girl. And he's in love with the white girl, and he makes a decision to be with the white girl. Then he's not being a magical negro. Not only is he wiping out all the black, all of the magical black negroes, but he is also not doing his job for his client. All for I keep telling man, white women are dangerous. He a kamikaze magical negro. Because right. you, because I yes, all of that you said is true. But what I said is still true. Two things are still true. You still making the white person happy at the end the of the wrong day. Wrong one. Right. You just not following suit. So this is this is the dynamic that this young magical Negro is in. Yeah. 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 I, I'm told I ain't even gonna lie to y'all. Um I must have <laughs> like drifted in some shit on part of the clip. <laughs> you met you lost. <laughs> <laughs> but because so i'm just gonna stick to the concept of magical negroes um and what they do and don't do but um apparently we're gonna have to see this fucking movie but I, it I'm, sounds I'm you know it, well it, it, i might do it for research purposes. purposes this shit sounds like um it sounds like something like like it gives off the tone of um dear white people you mm. know what i'm saying and and then you find out that this militant mixed sister has a white boyfriend. And the way you find out <laughs> that she has a white boyfriend is this person that she's uh, apparently, you know, going through this whole uh, debate, this, 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 this spirited debate with. And actually, you know, they're taking off each other's clothes in the dorm room and having sex. So, um, 
So it gives off that. But I find it interesting because all these types of films, when we look at them, they, they come from that particular tone. And you have to ask yourself a question like, you know, as they're marketed, you know, is this whole racial confusion put into play purposely? We all know it is, but it also speaks to the fact that um, it really becomes a, a journey of emotional labor for the black person in here that because they're doing all the work to to make everything happen, and it just speaks to you know um, it, it just speaks to a place where black people that whole notion of working twice as hard to get half as much and all that other bullshit, but also how a dog will do whatever it can to make his master smile. Say it again. A dog would do whatever it can to make his master smile, make his master happy. Now, now, you you talked about um, the um, uh, what the movie you just talked about? Dear, dear white, white yeah, dear white, dear white people, and the girl, uh, the black girl, ended up messing with the white boy. Y'all saw that? And I was like, oh man, I turned it off. I turned it off. I ain't gonna lie, but but you reminded me of Monsters Ball. Hmm. Because she know, was, was I was thinking about too, yeah. She was a magical yeah. negro too, but she was also a magical negro who was who had the spirit of whoredom inside of her as well. And mm -hmm. we saw that in that scene. <laughs> well, let me let me say this though to everybody that is kind of upset that black characters are used in this way in white movies. Um, because my feelings on that is distinctly different than the the damage caused by the trope my feelings on that is like and i understand this movie is supposed to be a comedy all of our movies have to be comedies or dramas but in any case um <clears throat> i always viewed it as something called you're not the main character like you're a side character. Unless you're the main character or a co-main character or a side character of some real importance, this is kind of your lot in life. Like as as like this is how you're a plot device. So instead yep. of getting mad that a movie that wasn't designed to explore you in the first place is using you as a plot device, why not create a movie? where you are the main character. I mean, anybody that writes stories uses plot devices. There are characters there. Their sole purpose is to move the story along. Black people beg for inclusion. You're included now. You're a plot device. What are you complaining for? And we gave you magic powers. Like, what you tripping for? Hey. Like, I don't understand what you don't understand. You want it to be, before y'all were begging me to include you, we had white, white plot devices. The magical people was white. You know what I'm saying? Spoonful of sugar, Mary Poppins, all of them. It was floating in the umbrellas. You said you wanted inclusion, so we gave you an umbrella. Here, nigga, hold it. And now you mad? Well, I, I don't, I, I can't win with you people. Well, like I said earlier, though, one of the biggest contradictions that we have is or, or just one of the biggest bullshit things is we talk about our characters and you know the the limited range of characters that white people or Hollywood gives black actors. But go to Tubi. <laughs> no, seriously, seriously, go to Tubi and go to Amazon Prime. See the movies, see the same movie recreated over. It's like three different types of movies that black people make just over and over and over. Mm. Like we 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 know we know about the pimps, we know about the gangsters, we know about the drug dealers, it's we know about the scammers, right? We know about the fake love stories. We know hey, what about the the um the, the reoccurring character where the husband and wife and either one of them have an affair and the person having an affair with be stalking and all these things. Like we keep creating those things. Tyler Perry with Medea. All these things. Look, we keep we keep recycling these caricatures that are demeaning to us. But then we get mad at white people 
when they and they're the originators of it, but we get mad at a group of people who don't have, I mean, who has the power to do what they want to do, and we don't have the power to move it along. But it's just like one thing that will help is us stop recycling those same characters over and over and over that that don't serve us. We yeah, know we, we know that get money, but stop doing it. Go ahead, I'm <laughs> go ahead, say it again. I need, if I see another version of New Jack City, I'm gonna lose my fucking mind. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, Plug Love was cool, but Plug Love was another version of the hood dope dealer. Plug we were on Belly 15. Cool. This shit run like Michael, My like uh, Friday the 13th joints, man. Bell oh. Belly, Belly and Shotters was the same movie. <laughs> so, but, <clears throat> and I'm glad you brought that up because these movies also speak about privilege, having access to that white world. And we have a lot of those magical niggas in real life. You look at who got Joe Biden elected. It That's was right. Pearls and uh, Chuck, Chucks and Pearls. Miss Kyla Harris was, was she's black this week? Is she is she African American again, or is she? She went to the celebration bowl, so I, I don't okay. know. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> once in a while, they just dip their toe in the pool. But uh, um, yeah. you know, we we have these magical Negroes that always show up. And, and and make the world a better place. We were just talking about some earlier in the chat. You know what I'm saying? Um, they make the world a better place for white folk, and they make things happen. Um, you know, if you look at all the inventions that black people never got credit for, they were magical Negroes. You know, seventy percent of the of of the world's inventions, especially that came from this country, were the hands of black people. But they just didn't, their names didn't make it to the patent office. Um, but to get back to your point about the movies, Joe, I think that, I think that it speaks to the fact that we, we're really trapped in certain ways in terms of the imagination and being able to actually think outside the box. And so we see somebody do it and we look at it from the perspective of, oh, man, nigga, I could do that shit. And mm -hmm. it's literally because you saw somebody that did it in the image of black faces. And so instead of thinking about, okay, what creative, you know, concept can we come up with? Because we claim we're the most creative people in the world, we're the smartest people in the world, we're the most genius people in the world. And why we, do we keep mimicking these, these, um, these same concepts instead of thinking outside? Like, how come we didn't think about a movie where we generated a black version of um what they call that shit out there in san francisco uh with the tech shit um silicon valley right like why you know we have a plethora like we literally could create that we have a plethora uh over here on the east coast especially between um philadelphia and the dmv there's a there's like a log jam of black colleges and if you go further down to dc so from Howard all the way up to Cheney, uh, you know, Lincoln University, we have a, a Bowie State. We have a lot of black colleges out here that actually can formulate that if we put the mindset and the concept to that and to create that type, like in real world, but also make a film about it. Make a film about um, creating a, a, um, a Silicon Valley East or not even the Silicon Valley, call it whatever else you want, but that it comes at the creation of black hands. So, um, my bad, go ahead. Uh, it's, it's just basically, it's just like, and, and that's just something, because that's a concept I've actually been thinking about ever since I went to um, to to the um, all black science fair that um, my brother Q Butter had up there in Brooklyn a few months ago, and he just had another one um, two weeks ago. But all black science fair, and I saw the genius of our, our black children. You know, um, they were making um, cars that was ran off of eight artificial intelligence. These are four and five year olds. They were designing cranes and um, all all sorts of shit. Things. You know, one one this young group out of actually out of Baltimore had um, come up with this uh, sophisticated cyber security. Um, protection thing. I can't. The, the shit was genius. They were thirteen year olds, and I'm thinking like, we have that, but 
But how come it doesn't seem to make it to the place where we actually get creative enough to, to make those things? You saw we made a film on a budget of less than $2,000. <laughs> The Independence Day project was made off of 2009. Now, of course, it was a documentary, but I'm just saying yeah. we can make a full length feature film <clears throat> off of less than $2,000. Then the budget they need to make stuff like this is fucking crazy. And we have the people in Hollywood that can actually do it if they determine, if they decided to. So, I, go ahead. Man. I think. We got to be honest, and I'm going to give a very unpopular opinion here. Y'all feel free to blast me if you want. Black people, and I'm thinking about this right now. This ain't nothing I've thought about before. Not in any real detail. Um, Black people are great when it comes to making an idea bigger we are not good when it comes to true creation and innovation and not, i say not, that not these days we, right i'm speaking spe like nowadays right we're not solving problems we're seeing how other people have solved problems and coming up with ways to make money off it we're seeing how other people are moving and like we're playing copy we're playing copycat and catch up all the time those are the only two games we know how to play um and so when i look at the movies like the black movies like one of the things that i think we got to be honest about is that black people are still not a free people mentally like Say, a free pe say that again. Say that again. Yeah, black people are not a free people mentally. A free pe a free person can because we have to use our we have to use our history, our memory of the past in order to plan the future, right? That that's that's literally how the brain works. Things that have happened to you are things that you use to conceptualize your future. That's why it's difficult to imagine making a million dollars if you ain't never made a million dollars before. But the moment you make a million dollars, it becomes real easy to imagine making more. Right, right. right. You know, so um, black people, because we are not free mentally, we can't imagine a world where we're actually really like truly legitimately solving problems taking accountability and responsibility for what's happening. The only thing we can imagine is the magical Negro. Our lot in life has been to make white people's life easier. That's how we've gotten by. Go ahead, Joe. No, but exactly what you just said, the last thing you just said. <laughs> we were brought here to make white people's lives easier. Were we not? That's the whole, we were brought here as labor, right? But also... A group of people who are not mentally free are digesting this movie, but a group of people who are not mentally free are supposed to be the magical Negroes. Remember the Negro mind, the, the Negro mindset, the Negro is destructive to himself and his people, but not to his to his creator. The Negro does the bidding of the creator. The magical Negro. It doesn't always have to be blatantly destructive, but it's destructive. Yeah. Mm, I ahead, think. Pal. No, I'm sorry. Uh, go ahead, PC. No, no, go ahead. I think, and the reason I say black people aren't good at innovate or uh, cre like, and I am speaking of now because back in the day. Mo like 80 and 90 percent of inventions are actually innovations on the previous invention, they're That's not right. new inventions, right? But the, like the further you go back, <laughs> just context up, the further you go back, black people did create things to solve problems. No, right, right, right. I'm and that's what I was getting to, right? Like, black people have the capacity to invent things, black people have invented things before. Um, but the 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 deeper you get into it. 
like into slavery and the times after slavery, the more and more you're seeing a lot of the black inventors aren't actually inventing, they're filing patents for innovations. They're changing something, which is most patents nowadays anyways. That's no slight on anybody. But even nowadays moving forward, how many times, because we don't groom our kids to solve problems. I think about it like in terms of like PC you were talking about, and I wasn't at the science fair. Um, but And this is a genuine question. At the science fair where those kids were presenting their brilliance, um, were there any conversations about potential problems that would be solved by what they were uh, building? Yeah, yeah. Um, you actually had uh, um, one young sister who actually put together, um, they were talking about um, ways to, what is it? Uh, it was one of those things where it was, a hydro, it was hydroponics or aquaponics. Mm -hmm. You know, creating aquaponics, aquaponics. Farm, you know, so so now you're talking about um, energy conservation, water filtration. You're talking mm -hmm. about, um, cre you know, with and when you put feeder fish in there, now you're talking about adding a food source. Other, you know, while creating, um, you know, um, vegetables and whatever other, um, you know, whatever other farming you wanted to do on top of that. So you had that. You had uh, young people talking about ways to you know, new forms of energy, you know what I'm saying? Um, using magnetism to solve, to, to create um, some energy solutions. I mean, some of the shit, I ain't gonna lie. I'm not even gonna lie. Some of the stuff I saw there, I'm still trying to wrap my mind around mm -hmm. because of how innovative it was. Um, <laughs> and um, so, so I'm still working on that part with me because as much as I love science, and I'm a science, I'm a geek, we talked about that before. Stuff I saw there was on some Star Star Trek type shit. So <laughs> and and I, I can tell you exactly what happens, and then I'm gonna shut up. Cause I've been around these kids. What happens is at a young age, 11, 12, 13, 14 years old, it stops around about 14. We groom these kids to think limitless, right? Like the kids in good programs. I'm not talking about that. The average kid ain't been groomed for that at all. But the kids in, in top-notch programs that actually care about the community, they're being groomed at a younger age to think with no limits, no bounds. They're encouraged to explore. And then 15, 16, 17, 18, they put a cap on them. Yeah. Yeah. And Side so. Locks them in. Yeah. It, 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 society, the culture, the environment, because all of a sudden now you got to be real. You got to be realistic. And so instead of encouraging them to explore, okay, where would you get the magnets from? What materials would you need to develop this? How could you procure those materials? Maybe even if you can't build it, maybe you could set up a company or some, some structure, some process where you could get the materials so somebody else could build it later. How do you get the process started? Those conversations are cut out because the limit sets in. We don't have the money. We don't have the resources. You ain't going to never be able to do that. Boom, boom, boom. So now you got a 19, 20 year old who the highlight of their intellectual life was a 13, uh, a science fair when they was 13 years old. Same uh, creative limitations. We're talking about the filmmaking industry. Well, that shit exists heavy in this conscious sector, this pan African sector, this black liberation, this black national sector. That shit exists heavy in here. The limits of what we can do, the limits on what we're willing to do. The limits on who's going to do what. It's almost like it's a. It's 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 the programming. I used to think it was a sickness, but it's a programming that's designed to make us sick, and our sickness inebriates us from being able to put together these concepts to work together to even get into a room where we can have a conversation to talk about expanding our horizons, because. To, be, to, to write the to, to put the Independence Day project together, which you brothers were a big part of, it took us seeing something that's not even here. Right. 
gotcha, 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 gotcha. I want to ask y'all a question. And this pertains to the clip in the beginning with the young lady. Um, one of the things she alluded to in that was talking about the prototypical magical Negro going back to Uncle Tom's cabin. And she was saying Uncle Tom was a prototypical magical Negro. And I'm thinking about it and I'm like, I don't know if I agree with that. I don't know if I agree with Uncle Tom being a prototypical magical uh -huh. Negro, but trying to get y'all thoughts on that. Like, looking at what Uncle Tom did, how does that character, how is that character similar to an mm -hmm. Uncle Remus or a Bag of Vance or uh, uh, um, the, the dude from the Green Mile? Like, how does, how is um, Uncle Tom the, the prototype for that? I'll say I don't, and it's been a while since I read Uncle Tom's Cabin, and I'm going to preface this by that saying that. It's been a while. Um, I don't really see the connection outside of the way Uncle Tom could be said to be viewed by the white people in the book. Um, But being a magical Negro isn't, isn't about how you're viewed right it's about what how you your right how you're used in the story so i i disagree with that but then it, like i said i haven't read uncle tom's cabin in a long time so when she said that i was like okay maybe my memory of uncle tom's cabin is off uh, i get uncle remus from um song of the south uh, there are a couple of other black characters that really come to mind. I got a whole list. Yeah, like um, Michael Clark Duncan from the Green Mile is a great one. Right. Um, uh, back yeah. of Vance, you know, um, uh, Morgan Freeman's character in um, uh, Shawshank Redemption. Yeah, I actually have a list. Um, so like the first own film, um. Magical Negro was Uncle Remus in 1946 in the Songs of the South. Then followed that up with Sidney Poitier with his character Homer Smith and Lilies of the Field. Have Cleavon Little as Super Soul in The Vanishing Point. Uh, Richard Pryor play, played Grover Muldoon in Silver Street in 1976. One uh, day they talked about Scatman Carruthers in The Shining 80, uh, Whoopi Goldberg and Ghost. Um, Morgan right. Freeman again and Robin Hood, Prince of the Thieves. Morgan um, Freeman has done it a lot. Right, right, right. We we talked about Halle Berry and Monsters Ball. Uh, that's another magical Negro. Uh, Miss that that character, Mister Church, that um Eddie Murphy, Eddie Murphy played. played. Yeah, that's what yeah. I was thinking about. The uh, green card was it? Cause what was that? Was Morgan Freeman and Driving Miss Daisy, wasn't it? Yep, yep, yep. Morgan Freeman had been a lot of magical Negroes. Yeah, Morgan Freeman is the most magical of the magical Negroes. Right, he is. Now, what's interesting he though, and God. <laughs> right now, what's he interesting? Died. He though, did play is, God. So the magical Negroes, and like it's like it's literal. They are literally magical, and like I read, they have all these powers, but they heal white people's problems, or they solve white people's problems rather than solving their own. And that could be a metaphor for us too. Like we have the power to solve our own problems. We just choose not to self solve our own problem. We choose oh, no. to solve our white, our it, white it, problems. Well, it absolutely is a metaphor, but here's the thing, right? The magical Negro exists in the realm where you don't get to see the magical Negro having problems. The magical Negro's world is perfect. Right. Um, well, he, well, he's well. The, the magical Negro is happy and content with his situation, right? Well, but the the magical Negro's world is not of such that it. I mean, Idris Elba and the 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 the, lad, the not the latest movie, the movie he was in. I want to say a year or two ago, where he played a genie, a gin. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, that. you know, uh, where he got mad at, at Queen Nefertiti for for spurring his love because she wanted to be with the white boy um but the the magical negro 
lives in a world where problems don't exist. And I think black people, instead of getting mad at white people for not presenting the to- like this character as a total character. I mean, because that's a silly argument to begin with. Look, if we watch it, like everybody has seen John Wick. How many people really give a damn about one of the thousands of people that he killed in that movie? Like, I ain't seen nobody yet saying we need to have a movie about one of the guards that John Wick shot in the face and how they family feels about John Wick shooting them in the face well, with a bazooka. Are you like, alluding to the NPR interview? I, I am. But anyway. Okay. okay. Well, <laughs> no, but, but context, context, context. So we found we found the NPR interview. Uh, I forgot the young lady's name. Well, I'll put the link in the description. We found the NPR interview. Morgan in Parker. Who? Morgan Parker. Morgan Parker. Okay, yeah. so the, the young lady was talking about um, giving the magical Negro a background, a, a a a story, like filling in the blanks and all these things for the magical Negro. And why? Why? That's a character that's not needed. You don't need to fill in that. But I, I thought what was what was um, funny about the 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 audio that we heard is. Um, she was talking about what the magical Negro is, but also kind of some of the stuff she was explaining sound kind of magical too. So, well, I just wanted to like <laughs> the point I was making before I got sidetracked with that because that silly thought just popped in my head midway into another point. Um, was that they don't show you the magical Negro going through problems. Because in, they don't care. In their world, none of your problems are more important than this problem that the main character is having. They don't care about your life. They don't, and, and that's that's just facts of being a lot. How many people look? I have had conv- and this is where I call black people out on their bullshit. I've had conversations with black people that said if they found out, if they lived in an all black neighborhood and found out that their son was the local serial killer, they would not turn their child in. Sure. They don't care about the damage and the repercussions. So if you don't care about the damage your own spawn does in your own community, why in the hell would you expect somebody from another community to give a damn? Like, if you want to tell these stories, tell these stories. But j- all right, I'm, I'm I feel yeah, like I'm on nah. a tangent again. I'm sorry, go ahead. Nah, but it, it what going back to some of the things we talked about earlier, though, is from a lot of the videos that I've saw on YouTube, everybody is pissed off at this trailer. Everybody, I saw so, uh, because the 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 video I put in the chat, and I was like, the first two minutes to do contradict what he was talking about is. <laughs> Because dude, dude was like, it was an Asian dude who was mad at the movie for black and white people. I'm not sure. I think he was mad for black people, I believe. But he contradicted himself because he was like, oh, this movie shouldn't be made. But then he tried to make a point as to why art should be made. And so he called himself and then had to realize, damn. So let me just throw ad homonyms and stuff. But it's like, you know, stuff, I, I'm basically saying that to say, I've seen that, I've seen Asian people, I've seen white people, I've seen black people, I've seen all types of people who are upset about this movie because like you said earlier, it turns all groups of people off as the movie goes, right? Um, but it, it's it's still reinforcing the stereotype that black people, our job is to serve white people. Um, it's a reminder that you have the power to save yourself. You just don't use your power to save yourself. and you will always be in the subservient place because you keep yourself there at this point. <clears throat> it's what we aim to do. It's what we aim to be, you know, like when that young lady at that last clip, when she was sitting in her room and even in the one where we were listening to um, with the young sister you referenced earlier, they are seeking the privilege of being there. They want their story told about why they're there. They don't necessarily look at it as a situation where 
you know, um, we're going to create something that's going to empower all black people. They look at it from the perspective of, I just want to be, I want my story told as a black person in this particular, in this particular position. Black people, have, especially now, this era, I'm not even going to call it a generation, this era of Negroes have lost their way. We don't see anything from the perspective of a community. And how a community is shaped because we don't have a culture that supports that. We want to talk about black people are not a monolith, which is the dumbest shit you can consistently say. Because when you consistently say that we're not a monolith, what you're basically saying is you don't want boundaries. You don't want to be bound to rules. You don't want to be bound to customs. You don't want to be bound to traditions that lock in, you know, your behavior. So you don't cut because the things you want to do would be considered taboo in that particular culture. We don't want that culture. There are pros and cons to everything. So the pros to being free and liberated and not wanting to, to, to have access or not wanting anybody to police you as people often use these, these um, you know, endearing terms that people come up with. Well, you're free to do that. But that also comes with the con. And the con is you're not protected by the community you supposedly serve or that you want to protect you at that specific moment. In other words, you can't say fuck the police. And then as soon as you get in trouble, call 911 to come rescue you. You got to choose a side. And a lot of us want that autonomy to be able to move freely like free radicals, but then not deal with the, the what comes. Sometimes free radicals escape, or sometimes free radicals are bounced out. They don't, I now sound like Pat. Free radicals go places that, uh, you know, that, that, you, that, that cause more damage, cause more harm. You know what I'm saying? You, now, if you, if you have a molecular structure as a community, the molecular structure. Everything has a purpose. You know, the protons, the neutrons, the electrons, they all have a purpose. And based on what their purpose is, is how they become, how they, is, is their response to matter. Now, I know I'm talking a lot of shit and it sounds crazy. In my mind, it makes sense, but I know it sounds crazy. Um, but what I'm saying is basically structure and order. And that comes with culture. And then you have protections within that culture. Because now you represent a protected class. We we don't we don't protect shit. We haven't protected hip hop, rock and roll. We haven't protected, you know, our urban what, what we consider to be urban culture. We haven't protected but, none of that shit. I, really, what? It's our fault for even having the thought that it was supposed to be protected when we have a history of protecting nothing in this country. True. Don't we set ourselves up to be mad because we like, I, and I hear you, we should have, but we don't, we've never been in a position to protect anything. We've never, because nobody's going to give us that position but ourselves, right? To be able to protect. Uh, chosen that position. Right, right, that's right, right. And nobody's going to get us out of this position. So that's why we're going to continue to see the tropes. We're going to continue to see the, the stereotypes. That's why they reminded us that you're supposed to be magical Negroes making white people's lives happier. You're supposed to be that. Um, but hold on, Joe. real quick before you get off of that, because and I don't know what y'all talking about when I have my technical difficulties. But we believe in that magical Negro too, right? We believe in that magical Negro because we be and we talk about him every February. Yep. You know what I mean? Malcolm X was a magical Negro. Because he was out there doing the work that most people stayed in their bed and was praying, okay, I hope Malcolm can get this shit done today. I'm going to go out here to the party. I'll be back. Well, Hopefully, Malcolm got that shit done. I, I, say, <laughs> I say, I guess, a different type of magical, because not putting, because I don't want people to hear that and think you saying Malcolm is the same type of magical, magical Negro. No, 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 no. I'm, saying, I'm saying the people that let Malcolm out there do the work, let Martin out there to do the work, the people who cheered from their TV screens and did oh, them, nothing. Oh, they, they lazy niggas. They, 
they saw them as magical Negroes. I would never disrespect the legacy of our greatest. Right, right, right. I'm just making sure people understand what you're saying that because you're not saying he's a magical Negro, but you're saying he was praised on by a bunch of lazy but Negroes. At this <laughs> point, we should need disclaimers because it's saying this stuff. If you're stupid enough to think that, then you shouldn't even be in the but conversation. Here's the thing, right? You see. A magical Negro... Being called the magical Negro isn't an indictment on the magical Negro. It's an indictment on everybody that supports and celebrates the magical Negro. So, like, because in a lot of these movies, when they do try to address, like, the magic the magic person having some problems, a lot of times another plot device is employed. Um which is this device, I forget what it's called, but basically the magical character can't use the magic to repair themselves. Right. So that that's another uh, component of it where, you know, that's the whole story of Aladdin. The genie couldn't set himself free. He needed to be wished free by the person who owned the limp. The, the difficulty was you only got three wishes. So you had to sacrifice one of your wishes to set this other motherfucker free. That almost never happened. Right. Right. And I right. think that is what we're looking at when we're talking about the magical. Look, black people are more of a monolith than we are not one. Well, if we want to be honest. Well, go ahead, Joe. But also, um, I think you said the PC earlier because looking at it from like the magical Negro assimilation and meritorious manumission. So being able to look at it at that angle too, because being the magical Negro as an individual gets you higher status, gets you more praise, gets you an elevated sense of self, gets you further alone than other black folk who are not willing to do that. And so in, in conjunction with what you're talking about, yes, the people is the is it affect the people around it, but those who do, if you were a person in real life who decided to be a magical Negro, your ass affected negatively, mentally, but you're gonna get the positive accolades from the white folk that you're being magical to as well. Yeah. yeah. Um I can't argue with that. Nah. <laughs> well, you know, just just in my mind, just just Context. <laughs> right. Context. Yeah. So, um, and the way we have taken things, and many of us, I mean, it's funny because we was having this conversation, I think me and Pat was having this conversation just yesterday about the notion of what's real and what's not based on how much time we spend in social media, right? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the concepts. So, for for us to actually get out of this place, right? Because I think that it's important to recognize this box that we're in. For us to get out of this place, we have to start envisioning and creating scenarios for which speak to, to things that don't currently exist right now. We have to start talking about what, what we have to explain what, the, what a visionary really is. We have to actually teach people how to use their imagination. Yeah, keep in mind, too, man, over the last 30 years, a lot of the things that made young people creative have been taken out of schools. A lot of schools don't have art class anymore. They don't have crafts anymore. A lot of schools don't have um, automotive technology. They don't have home ec. And why do you think a lot of that stuff is just basic training? A lot of that stuff had people explore. A lot of the things we talked about in terms of utilizing the ingenuity to, to create advances and then letting that be the next invention, a lot of that stuff was developed with those minds that started, the catalyst was started in those rooms. And a lot of those things were taken out of schools. A lot of the after-school programs where children could do the fine arts, the things of that nature, those things are taken out of schools. The, and especially when you talk about poor communities where um, people can't really afford to do that, the cost of living has been in some places doubled and tripled. People are scratching right now trying to figure out where they're going to call home. A lot of that stuff plays into it. And, you know, we get to pretend that we're doing the just fine on social media and, and, and things of that nature. But 
the, the shit has hit the fan. Winter's here. And because of those things, you know, we have to really now be um, coming up with some really creative ways to operate because our mere survival as a people depend on it. This is end game. Our survival as a people depend on our ability to cre be creative because the world is always, we always talk about it like the world, like the war on black people, but we talk about it from a mythological place. We don't talk about it from a liberal, like a literal place. And the war is literally on us economically, environmentally, you know, because in addition to that, we also know that they poison our children. They poison them with the water that they have in the schools. They poison them with the food that they feed them. They poison all of us in the, no, in the, in the food, in the place. We talked about a few weeks ago. But those things are real, too, because you find in a lot of places that high dense, like high violence and um, agi easy agitation. In a lot of those areas, you find a lot of chloride and you find a lot of fluorine in the water, like overly represented in the water, along with the lead pipes that they come through. That stuff matters. Like, we're going to talk about Flint, Michigan in a few years. I'm praying it don't, but it most likely will. And we're going to talk about the outcomes. But nobody's going to think about the Flint water crisis that led to this shit. You know what I'm saying? And that's still going on, by the way. Nobody's going to talk about that. And therefore, you say, well, you kids are just not using your imagination. Well, you got inhibitors in the fucking water. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, you know. I mean, look. I mean, look. We had a... Yeah. Go ahead. I'm Joe. Sorry, Joe. We're, we're, at, we're at a... Look. We're at a point now. And I, I, I hear what I, I hear what you're saying, and I don't disagree. But I'm not... I'm not going to let us off the hook because... We complain, 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 complain about our representation in film, in cinema, in Hollywood, in the media. We complain about our representation. Because like I say, I'm not disagreeing with you, but I'm just saying, I'm looking at black people from this angle too. We complain, 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 complain about everything, but when we are in the driver's seat to make ourselves look different, we don't. We don't. And then we make excuses as for why we don't. Like, yeah, ask ask a uh, uh, black dude, comedian, comedian. What's his name? Um, that's in this movie. Uh, David Allen Greer. Yeah, ask David Allen Greer why he did the movie. He gonna give you some roundabout answer. He gonna give you <laughs> some some liberal answer. Of, well, this need to be told and all these things. Why why does why does this need to be retold? But once again, going back to the independent filmmakers and all these things who making all the crazy films. Why are you making these? Because you all you're gonna do is come up with the wildest excuses as, as to why you're making the stuff that you're making. But one of the things you talked about is black people are totally dependent upon white people. And this movie is a reminder of that. Mm -hmm. Your mission and your purpose is white people. And without us, because without, if he didn't serve his white master, he ceased to exist. Mm -hmm. Think about that. Our whole mission and purpose is to serve them. This was a total reminder, but it's also um, pulling the veil back because, you know, like we said, some Clarence Thomas and folk like that, magical Negroes that, that really exist. Like they're magical Negroes that really do exist in our communities and throughout America. So being able to see it like that. But this movie is just a reminder to me, in my opinion, and it's just Joseph Warthaw. It's a reminder for us. Hey, I was put here to be magic niggas. Don't forget who you is. We just got to remind y'all every now and then. Some of these movies we put out, y'all ain't really get it. So we had to be blatant about this one. So, And keep in mind, this movie was made by a black person. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. And remember, Love and Hip Hop was made by a black person. And remember the Shade Report is made by African people. All skin folk ain't kin folk. I'm, I'm sorry. Just saying. I'm just saying. But that 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 
Negro mindset. The magic of Negro is a part of that Negro mindset that we be always talking about. Um, I also one last thing. I, I thought it was interesting that most of the magic of Negroes, because they did a um they did a skit on Key and Peel, because I, I looked at um a Key and Peel skit and a Daily Show skit that um the black host um Roy Moore did on the Daily Show. Um, but the Key and Peel one kind of reminded me that the one of the things about the magical Negro is they always impart the white person with folk wisdom. Now, you know, just because that milk does spill don't mean you can't fill that cup up with love, you know, stuff like that. But then the Key and Peel took it to, you know, extreme because they had a, a magical Negro superpower fight. So there was enough fighting to be able to come over uh, to see who the strongest so they can help the white person. And there was also in the uh, that Netflix is scary. Some one of those skits that they had all the magical Negroes. They was trying to de magical Negro fire them, and then as soon as a white person came around, they all fought to get to the white person to help the white person. Subconsciously, subconsciously, we all fighting to help white people, and we don't even know it. I've actually seen that shit in real life. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That, that's 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 hilarious to actually hear it play it out like that. But I've literally seen people, <clears throat> I've seen people do that in rooms full of black people. It's like two white folk in the whole room, and they was just like celebrities that bitch, and they nobody knew who they were. Hey man, dude, um, in the monsters, uh, not monsters ball, but dude in the Green Mile for Michael him, Clark Michael Clark Duncan, for him to, um save the white man or cure the white man he had to grab his meat he had to grab his penis he had to grab and hold on to his penis and transmit his magical powers through his penis to to cure him of what um what he had um urinary tract infection or whatever he had but he had to grab his penis to to heal him what type of freaky symbology is that i've seen <laughs> I ain't seen nothing like that, but I was gonna say what to what PC said. <laughs> I have seen, and it's been a while since I seen the Green Mile too. Let me say that as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I won't be going back. <laughs> uh, Thanksgiving, white person shows up. Watch how watch how your family turn into magical Negroes. <laughs> When somebody bring a white person home, why, 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 watch how friendly they get to that white person. Just watch. Bruh, I know y'all have seen it before. I've seen it at a at a at a uh, black nationalist um, summit. One white man in the room changed the whole fucking conversation. I, bro, yeah, yeah, I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm so. Cool. You know, magical Negro needs to die. But the only way the magical Negro dies is if we overthrow that Negro mindset and, and, and get away from that. Because at this point, you know, they're just going to keep reminding us, your job is to serve us, not Black Dell. You, you little Blackie there, you little Jungle Bunnies. Our job, your job is to serve us. So, yeah. But what are you all's thoughts on the magical Negroes? Make sure you get in the comments and tell us what you think about the magical Negroes, what you think about the conversation, what you think about the clips. Are you going to see the movie? And if so, why are you going to see the movie? What are you trying to get out of this? Talk to us in the comments. Let's get a lot of conversation going on in the comments about this. And also, make sure y'all check out Fet Life Station. Uh, FetLifeStation.com tonight, 7 p.m. PC going in like he always be going in. And, you know, that... Uh, uh, you know, it's it's um it's it's the 29th. I was finna say I was finna say it's uh New Year's Eve, but no, it's the 29th. So today is the 29th, but New Year's Eve of New Year's Eve. So spin it with PC and the us is here. FatLifeStation.com, 7 p.m. That's how we do it. Like, comment, subscribe, share all that good stuff, and yeah, highlight.